Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show that talks about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I hope you'll join me as I chat to everyday people with not-so-everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation over in the Let's Talk Near Death online community, which is found at www.letstalkneardeath.com. Membership is free, or you're welcome to upgrade to join the live VIP events, to gain early access to episodes, or to receive extra VIP bonus material. Your support helps me to continue to get episodes out and to help grow the conversation around these types of experiences. But before then, let's talk near death. And our boat went into it. And as our boat went into it, it flipped upside down. All I remember is being thrown onto a rock and bashing my head on this rock. And there was this brilliant light. It was, this, it was white and it was this experience where sometimes now I can shut my eyes and try and go back in that place in this incredibly extraordinary, vibrant white light. I was in this incredible place of ecstasy. And at the same time, still aware I was moving forward. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Today I'm chatting with Sue O'Callaghan, who had a near-death experience as a result of a whitewater rafting accident. Sue remembers being tossed out of the boat, being thrashed about in the rapids under the water, having her near-death experience, and then being back in her body. Today we'll chat about this experience, we'll chat about how she may have already known that this was going to happen before it happened, and how her beliefs in this experience have been shaped ever since. Today, Sue is doing some amazing work in the area of mental health, specifically with women and teens, and she's also known for her wealth of information and knowledge and what makes individuals feel happy, confident and secure. So is the author of Taken, the inspirational true story of a mother's epic win against social services. And she's the co-author of Hate Myself, Hate My Life, a teenage guide to finding self-confidence and inner love. So so welcome to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. It is fabulous to have you here. Thank you for having me on board and thank you for the recordings that you do because these are such amazing experiences, obviously, for everybody. Tell us, how did this all take place? How did this happen? So I was taking a group of students on an outward bound expedition in Borneo. I was teaching in Singapore at the time and it was about 1997. And one of the exercises we were doing was to go on a whitewater rafting trip through the jungle in the river. We'd been, already we'd already climbed Mount Kinabalu, so we were pretty exhausted. It was a couple of days up and down Mount Kinabalu. We were having an amazing time. The jungle was extraordinary, so we caught the train through the jungle for about an hour and a half, and we were left at the beginning of a river, and I was engaged at the time, and my partner was with me, and he said, gosh, it's interesting because the river's quite low, and when the river's low, it's more dangerous. And I thought, well, it can't really be dangerous. It's sort of, you know, meandering quite slowly down and we put our life jackets on and he put the helmet on my head and he's big into health and safety because he worked on oil rigs so he said your helmet's not going to stay on your head like that I'm going to really tighten it up I remember him tightening my helmet and pulling my life jacket really tight and we got in the boat and we were paddling down and we probably had about well you we had about 90 students all together but in our raft we probably had 20 students so quite a big raft and they're going down the river um, for about 10 minutes and actually it wasn't I was actually quite afraid it was quite interesting I wasn't relaxed I wasn't enjoying it because he'd already said to me when when rivers are low it's quite dangerous so I was actually quite nervous and we saw ahead this big stopper which is obviously when water goes over a rock and it causes a sort of whirlpool after it and we saw two boats go ahead of us with students in it and both of them got stuck in the stopper because what happens when the river's low is the stoppers are much faster and more dangerous because the water doesn't flow and take you out. Mm. So the two boats went down, they got stuck. And so I was actually quite fe- feeling quite terrified at this stage. We, then our boat went into it. And as our boat went into it, it flipped upside down. And my leg got stuck around the rope that was around the outside of the boat. 
And so as the boat went upside down, I went underneath the boat and my leg was stuck. But then what happened was my leg released. But then the experience of being in the stopper was that it was like a bath plug where you were going down and down and down and also a washing machine where you were going around and around and around. And what was happening was that the stopper would occasionally spurt me out. But all I remember is being thrown onto a rock and bashing my head on this rock. Luckily, I had my helmet on and all I was thinking at the time, yeah. my, you know, my, my fiancé just saying that's not going to stay on your head. And it's quite interesting because I must have gone down and up a few times because I remember each time thinking I've got to take a breath. But every time I came to take that breath, I wasn't quite sure which position I was in when I could actually take that breath because when I was up, the boat was on top of my head and I was on the rock and I go down again. So I actually have got no recollection of how many times I went up. It might have only been three times, but it felt like 20. And every time I hit my head on the rock, I went back down and I remember thinking I was weaker and weaker until it got to the stage where I took this one breath and then my lungs filled up with air, with, with water, and that was it. Then I knew that I had no choice. I actually couldn't hang on any longer. So instantly I went down. Now, this is where it gets really difficult because it's, you'd like to put words to the experience, but I don't actually think there's words in the English language that would describe the experience. I'd like to say I went down this tunnel, but it wasn't really a tunnel. Tunnel's the nearest word you can use, but it was an experience of, of moving slow motion, incredibly slow motion. And there was enough time there to be aware I was dying. There was enough time in that space to think it was incredibly slow and I had a choice as to what I did and so my whole life flashed before me in that moment and I again one I didn't know whether it was 10 minutes one minute it could have even been less than a second but in that time it felt like slow motion and I all I could think was I haven't had my children yet I was about to get married I was going to go home and get married in a couple of months time I hadn't had my children I knew I was going to have four children so I thought this is not my time my time's not up but yet I was going further and further down and there was no recollection at all of being in pain. There's no recollection at that stage of my lungs being filled with water before I felt I died. I mean, I think I had died at that moment. One doesn't know again. Mm -hmm. I felt as though I died. I was on this journey and there was this brilliant light. It was, this, it was white and it was this experience where sometimes now I can shut my eyes and try and go back in that place in this incredibly extraordinary, vibrant white light. And... I can, I can go back to that place if I want to and re, re, we'll kind of go back into it. But at the time, it was just overwhelmingly, wow, amazing. And I was going further and further towards it. So I was in this incredible place of ecstasy. And at the same time, still aware I was moving forward but still aware that I had a choice to make. And it wasn't, right, so you've got to make a choice. Are you going to go? Are you going to stay? It was just, again, a sort of um, multidimensional, weird experience that I can't put words to. Wow. Gosh, that is amazing. I love how you haven't, you're saying the, the words aren't there, that we can't actually put words to that so how did you what happened next did you make a choice I, how felt, I felt as though I wanted to go and I felt as though I wanted to stay and it wasn't that I wanted to go and die because I wasn't really aware at that stage I was dead or was dying I think I was dead but mm -hmm. it wasn't a choice of right I'm now dead I've got to come back or go it was just going on this journey like you're walking down you know, through, through some woods and the path divides into two, and you think, oh, which way should I go? Should I go that way or should I go that way? That way looks exciting, so does that way. And I'm not quite sure. And you're standing there just trying to make a decision as to which way to go. And you're not thinking, well, what's at the end of each one? You're kind of thinking, which one looks quite nice quite right now in this present moment? So I was very aware that I was just kind of making this choice. And I wasn't thinking I'm going to live or die. I was just, which of the two paths shall I take? Shall I go back or shall I go forward? And it was just enticing me on. It, was, it wasn't pulling me on, but I felt as though it was pulling me on. It was just this wowness of this experience I'd never had before. So I wanted to go on. And so I was kind of reluctant to go back. But at the same time, I, all I had in my head was, it's not over yet. You've got to have four children. You're about to get married. You can't go. You can't go. And then again, I remember the next moment, it, I didn't actually 
feel as though I'd said, all right, I'm ticking the box to live as opposed to ticking the box to die. But I obviously decided not to go on because the next moment I remember somebody grabbing me and then I think I fell unconscious. Then I remember being dragged through the water and it was quite turbulent at that stage and there was a couple of people around me. Then I lost consciousness again. So obviously then I was alive. I was coming back but in and out of consciousness. So I'd made the decision not to carry on, which was quite sad because I'd love to know the rest of it. Although I think I was in it. I think I was actually, I was in it. Um, And then what I remember is we were in the river at the bottom of a sort of ravine with this massive, well, not a cliff edge, but a huge bank. And the railway line was on top of it. And they had to drag me up this railway sort of embankment. And all I can remember was my lungs just being filled with water and just coughing, 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 but not being able to get them up. Just this experience of terrific pain and just being filled with water. And then again, being dragged up. And I think I was in and out of consciousness at the time. And then apparently what happened was they had to wait for a train to come and had to hail a train, basically stop a train as it came through the jungle. And all the other students that were at the bottom of the river watched what was happening because everybody else in the boat managed to be sort of spurted out by the water, the force of the water. But because I was under the boat, I couldn't get out. And what happened is actually my ex-husband, another guy, had managed to get back to me to pull me out but they said I was down there for about six minutes. That's quite a long time. Oh, that is a long time. Yeah, yeah, that's a really long time. And interestingly, the whole thing was videoed because all the whole week was videoed. And so a few years later, when I was trying to get all the videos onto CDs to stop them, you know, rotting or going moldy, I was watching them, all these CDs we'd made, you know, about 30 CDs. And I went through it. I didn't know it was videoed and I saw this experience. And the children were shouting out, that's Miss O'Callaghan, that's Miss O'Callaghan, she's died. She said, Miss O'Callaghan's died. And there are these horrific screams and this experience of the children. And you can just see this boat. It was filmed from further down the river, looking back at it. And you can see this boat going upside down. You can see his head coming up, sort of helmet head and going down again. And I think it was probably about four or five times I went up and down. But the rest of the story is that then they had to hail a train and the train journey back into Kinabalu was about an hour and a half. And I can remember at various stages um, just trying to cough this water up, but just feeling so I had no ability to even cough it because of just the weight in my lungs and then falling unconscious again. And then I don't remember any experience of getting into the hospital or anything, but I remember waking up in hospital and again, I think I had tubes down my lungs at that stage with this terrific pain. And then I think they put me, they put me out for a while. Um, but the experience was terrifying going into the, to that stopper and the experience coming out of it was absolutely terrifying. And even being in hospital for a couple of days was terrifying because the pain, but interestingly, you know, when I was, when I was in that NDE, whatever you want to call it, there was no pain. There was no fear. There was fear after and before, but there was no fear in that place. There was no pain in that place. There was ecstasy. There was pure joy and incredible peace incredible I mean the white light for me was just peace it was slow motion it was another dimension it was wowness it was just I mean I've never taken taken drugs but if that's what ecstasy is then that was ecstasy um Mm -hmm. the wowness and what's really interesting is to think about that before experience and that after experience of the fear and the terror and the, the awareness and then that middle experience of death just thinking just wowness utter wowness amazing and I wish there was words, you know, it's like when I used to speak a bit of French and in French there were so many more words to describe something that was beautiful. You know, we could just say something's beautiful, but the French could say it in 66 words and just be amazing. But in the English language, we don't have the vocabulary and probably even French we don't, but you cannot put into words that experience of wellness, awesomeness, wonder, amazement, ecstasy, joy, peace, love, light, mm, beauty, mm. radiance. Amazing. Mm. Well, wow, it really gives us something to look forward to, doesn't it, when we potentially go back there again or experience that again. Yeah. What was it like for you, so when you woke up? So you woke up in the hospital, you'd been through all of this, they'd, you had the tubes down, you, they cleared your lungs. Yeah. At what point did you realise the depth of what had happened to you? I think only I was in trauma. We then went back to the centre we were staying on, in Kinabalu, which was a sort of outward bound um, sort of centre where we had these 90 students staying and they were doing 
you know, rope climbing and rock climbing, abseiling, all, all sorts of things on the site. So a couple of days we had off, one obviously was climbing the mountain and the other one was having this white water raft experience. But we then stayed there for another three, four days. And I was, I think I was in hospital for a couple of days, came out and all the kids were doing these amazing things. And I just remember being zoned out. I wasn't quite there. I was just mm. in another place. And I was then went into trauma afterwards, went into terror and trauma. Um, and I went back into the fear of being back in the water. So I was traumatized by the terror of being stuck in the water and the, the, the helplessness that just couldn't get out. I couldn't move on. I couldn't do anything about my experience. And just knowing I was alone in there and just knowing that every time I came up for air, there was no air, just filling my lungs, filling with water, just thinking this is my last chance. So I then relived, uh, interesting, I didn't re- relive the incredible experience. I lived, relived the trauma and I went into PTSD for a while after that. What's really amazing is that I was a painter at the time. I'd studied art in London for four years and was teaching art. I was head of art at the United World College in Singapore, which is one of the biggest art colleges in the world. I was head of art, massive department, had seven staff. And what was incredible was I was painting all at the time, sort of premonitions. I always have a premonition of what was going to happen in life. And I didn't, I was never aware of it. So when my husband went back, my, my, um, pre-husband my fiance went back to where we were living in Singapore we looked at this painting standing there and it was a painting of me in these sort of swirly bits of water really and it looked just like he just went oh that was you drowning and I was I was in water going around in a washing machine I was in water going down in the bath plug and it's bright colors but it was beautiful painting huge painting I was painting figurative sort of work at the time but it was me in it. It was incredible. And it was, it, I looked at that and went, <gasps> and I've never really been able to look at that painting since. I think he's <laughs> I'm not surprised. And I had a premonition of it. I knew it was going to happen. And I think that's why, I think that explains when I got in the boat to go down the river, I was in fear already. And nobody else was. Everyone's kind of, what an amazing experience. And, you know, even if he'd said it's more dangerous when it's sort of half full the river, no one should be in fear. But I was in fear. And I always had these experiences through life that I could sort of second guess what was going to happen ahead quite sort of I can premise what's going to happen yeah um and that was the experience I painted it before so on the outward education center then I was in trauma didn't relive the experience of ecstasy and joy for quite a while after us and when it really hit home was when we got back to school and the headmaster called me in his office and I thought he was going to say so sorry to hear what happened but he said not a word not a word to anyone don't mention anyone oh wow and then I thought oh this is quite serious I think I die so that was that was really scary for me and that was really frightening that I had to shut up and not tell anyone what happened and then I went into serious trauma but interestingly I mean I've I've had another experience in my life of terror and fear and I through those experiences became suicidal and what's really interesting is that I always had a fear of death since when I felt suicidal. But actually, when I look at dying, it is the most incredible experience ever. Mind blowing. And it has taken all fear of death away from me. I think the suicidal feelings were the fear of living not the fear of death. So that's quite interesting to me because I know now in the future, I have no fear of dying at all. It was incredible. Absolutely mind blowing. So that fear of death that was removed when you had this near death experience, is that correct? Totally. Totally. Yeah. 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 Because none of us know what it's like. I mean, it's one thing that's guaranteed for all of us is we're all going to die sometime. That's the only thing, isn't it, in our life, other than the fact we were born. The only thing that's guaranteed for all of us is we're going to die. We just don't know when. And obviously when you have no experience of dying yourself and you hear stories from other people, it might be they've died in pain. I mean, I've lost both parents. They've, you know, they've died um, through sickness or you hear people dying in car accidents or suicide, but there's always an uncertain element about it because you can't be in that experience with them. I've held both my parents' hands when they're dying. And I have to say it's the most beautiful, peaceful experience, even though they died of cancer, both of them, the moment of death for them, I could since see almost their spirit leaving and going, but I could feel 
that moment in holding the hands I could feel that moment and I'm actually shivering now saying it because the minute that they actually died and both were unconscious for a while so you couldn't really say they were alive or dead or tell the exact moment but I felt the moment their spirit left their body and I felt that intense peace enter my body and the joy and all I just felt was when they left was this incredible sense of joy and I relived that experience holding their hands yeah wow I love hearing these stories of people right at the end of their life having what you're talking about there's a time where people feel the spirit leaving they feel the joy they sometimes communicate there's shared death experiences where they go through the death process with them I love that there's so many dimensions to this there's so much depth to the dying experience itself it's just beautiful isn't it well, I'm covered in shivers all over as you're saying it because yeah. it actually was my father who passed away 11 years ago. As I held his hand, then I felt his spirit leave, but I knew I had to st stay there for probably about half an hour because his spirit was still in the room. And I just waited and I just waited and waited because I just waited for, I could sense his spirit there. And he wasn't ready to go, he wasn't ready to leave, or it, he took a while to go. And I just stood there and I, just, I, was, I was sitting there holding his hand and just still talking to him. And interestingly, even he was probably what we would call unconscious. He was on oxygen and he was sedated very heavily, so couldn't communicate at all. But for probably about four or five days before, I knew he was so conscious. I knew he was so aware. And I was talking to him, having conversations with him. We were playing his favorite music. And most people would have said, he can't hear you, can't sense you. I knew he could sense and hear absolutely everything. And only one time in those five days when I just said, Daddy, I love you so much. I just felt this tiny twitch in his finger and I knew he was communicating with me. And I've always said to people, I've, I mean, I've been with quite a few people dying in hospital and relatives holding their hands said, talk to them. They can hear everything. You think they're unconscious. They can hear absolutely everything. And I had this sense that just, just keep talking. Just keep loving them. Play their mu favorite music. Have the conversations you want to have. Don't think they can't hear you. They can so hear you. And in that sense, when I was under the water, I knew everything that, that was happening. Absolutely everything. And even, I mean, I'd had experience. I'd had an accident in Sydney many years before, and I was put into a state of, what do they call it? Um, a steady state coma, an induced coma. So I was in, in an induced coma for three days. And I remember every conversation, everything somebody said to me, the nurse, what the nurse said to me. And at the end, they said, you were unresponsive for three days. And yet when they were talking to me, and this is the same as when I had my drowning experience, when they were talking to me in hospital, they were saying, can you say your name? Can you say your name? So I was saying, yes, yeah, Sue Callahan." And they said, can you say your name? Can you say your name? And I was saying, yes, yeah, Sue Callahan." They were saying, can you say your name? I was saying, yes, yeah, Sue Callahan. How many times do I have to say it to you? How many times? Wow. They, they, you know, how many fingers am I holding up? And I'd be three. How many fingers am I holding up now? Two. And they'd ask me again and again. And I'd say, why do you keep asking me the same questions to asking me? And I yeah. thought I was responding, communicating. And at the end, they said, you were completely unconscious. I said, I wasn't. I knew exactly what was saying. I knew the names of the nurses, the doctors, what they were doing to me. And when they were inducing me into a steady state coma, they said, we're going to induce it. And I was saying, I'm not pregnant. I don't need inducing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, I'm not pregnant. Don't induce oh, me. It's hilarious. And, yeah, and but the same experience was true in the water. I knew exactly what was going on. But I was going down the tunnel. I was I was dead as such. I was going down the tunnel. I was in the white light. I was in this peace and joy. But I still knew sort of around me, behind me, the experience of what was going on. I could see in slow motion the water kind of still doing its thing. But it wasn't violent like it was when I was alive. It wasn't going around this way. It was kind of going really slowly and beautifully and peacefully, but still doing its thing. So I was aware of everything around me. And I, was I could even sense, couldn't see it or feel it, I could sense the boat above me as I was sort of going down. So everything that was in, in life still there was very peaceful and calm and beautiful. But when I came back, it was it was violent and turbulent. <clears throat> so it's really interesting, that different dimension. And then holding my father's hand and my mother's hand, just experience, I could sense where they were. This, I was holding their hand and they were in that place of peace and beauty and joy and ecstasy. And my, I even sensed my father, the wowness that he was sensing and feeling, but he was dead. But mm. because I was connected to it, it was just mind-blowingly beautiful. It was gorgeous. Mm, that is beautiful. Have you had any kind of... I guess, interaction with your father or your mother since. have A lot of people, once they've had the near-death experience, they've got, it's almost like an open door, that connection point to the afterlife or a spiritual world or something beyond what we have here physically. Have you had any communication or visitations or anything 
Isn't that right? I, I can't say I've had a visitation, but I'm certainly when, when my father's around me, when my mother's around me. And I know, I mean, when, when birds appear, it's always my mother. Always, always my mother. And I just stop and I have shivers and I just sit and I just watch. And the birds, I mean, there's a couple of birds the other day and one stayed in the tree outside and it just literally looked in the kitchen windows. I, and I just said, I'm just going to watch because I know it's my mother and I'm just going to watch. And, and literally the bird just stood like that for ages and it looked at me and it looked at me and it looked around and it looked around and then it kind of was flapping its wings as if to say, I'm going to go now, but it didn't. It stayed and I just thought, it's my mother. So my mother just come and say, I'm, I'm still here, I'm still around, I'm not far away. And um, my father then always comes when I'm near water and I can't say it's a presence of seeing my father as such but I just feel a presence not even like wind when I just know it's a sense of knowing that he's there and it's a confirmation and it's a sense of joy that they're, they're cool and they're fine and there's been some really difficult times in my life where I've known they've just appeared and I've seen a, a sort of image of the three of us holding hands together with them on either side of me just actually walking me through it so very strong presence, yeah. And, and actually we tragically lost um, a 14 year old girl that we semi cared for for a while. And she lived in England, but her spirit couldn't leave her body. And she came to New Zealand, she lived in New Zealand for a while and she came to New Zealand. And I said to a friend, I feel as though, I won't mention her name, but I feel as though her presence is here. And she said, you're right, she is, because she needs releasing. She's in turmoil, she needs releasing. So I just said, well, I don't know what to do. And um, I just said, oh, well, what, what shall I do? I just kind of put it out there, what shall I do? And it was just hold her, just love her, just absolutely love her. Hold her, love her, allow her to be in your presence because when she's ready, she'll go. And she stayed about five days, the presence again of her in the room. And it wasn't anything difficult, awkward. It was just a presence of her in the room. And five days later, I thought, oh, she's gone. And it was just loving and it was just being in in, in the same vicinity, it was just then I just felt this presence of, oh, she's gone. And again, it was that presence of the ecstasy in that moment of the white light, and it was a releasing, and it was just an awareness. And it was the same sort of awareness of, oh, I'm back. <laughs> I haven't gone. Yeah. yeah. Very strange. Very, very strange. Oh, wow. That's amazing. You said that your father is often, you feel his presence with you when you're around water. Is that because, is, do you have a fear of water? I've got a lot of things going through my mind right now. Are you afraid of water after the experience that you've been through? Terrified of water, yeah. And um, I used to swim a lot in Singapore. So we had our own swimming pool over there and the condominium we lived in. And I loved the water. But now I will only go on the water in a boat, but I, I won't. I hate going out of my depth. And I've wanted to swim since. So what I did last year my sister lives not far from me we live on the water here in Devonport and she's a sea swimmer she swims all year round and there's loads of sea swimmers and I go and join them for coffee afterwards but I won't swim with them and last year I said see this is ridiculous you've got to go swimming so I swim in a swimming pool that's fine because I know I can touch the edge and I can put my feet down and they say come on you can come and swim out to the boys way out <laughs> no way no way am I going to do it so last mm. year I made myself and this is from 1997 to now, so what's that, 23 years later, I made myself go in the sea and put my head underwater, and that was huge for me. Yeah. And it, swimming pool, I can do it, but the sea, even if standing on the shore to put my head under the water in the sea, because there's waves and there's movement in there, that was terrifying for me, but I made myself do it. And by the end of the summer last year, I was swimming up and down the shore every single day, but I had oh, to be on the shore and I had to be when it wasn't rough and wavy and I had to be it wasn't even sort of up to here it had to be waist tight so I could still swim in it up and down and I'm a strong swimmer but I don't think I'll ever be able to go out and they go out every Sunday they say Sue you know by the time you've done a couple of years of, of just swimming along the shore where you can put your feet down you'll go out to the boys never I'll never do it yeah, Never I, and I, I know that. I'm that. fine with that. I'm fine with it. It's not something where I set a challenge and say, you know, I'm setting myself a challenge, and of course you've got to do it. I don't need to do it. Why do I need to do it? I love swimming in the mm. sea, up and down the shore, swimming in the sinkhole. I will never do it. And even being on a boat, I'm like, get me out of here. Can't do it. I'm I'm out. I can't see land. Get me out of here. Can't do it. Mm. Mm. And I can completely understand that because what a traumatic thing to go through. So my question was around whether you think your father's there because. There is that fear, there's those memories. He's comforting you that it's okay to be around water. I think so. And he was a sea swimmer and he loved the water too. So I think 
very much his spirit is around the water because that's what he loved. But I think you're definitely right. There's a presence of safety because he's there, protection. But still, I mean, even if he was there, even even if he said to me, you know, in that in that spirit land, come out to see, which he wouldn't do. But I mean, I wouldn't do it. Wow. Yeah. It's it's so interesting. In terms of your job, so. So you had your near-death experience. You're working in this outdoors environment where there's lots of adventure, there's lots of challenges. Were you able to go back into that work or once you went and saw the principal of the school, was that kind of the end of that job for you? No, no, because I was head of art. So I was coaching art, teaching art. Um, And we had, I mean, it was a school where we did masses of expeditions. So I made sure I signed up for the ones where there wasn't water. I mean, we did, a, we did a sailing trip just before that where we went sailing in the South China Sea for seven days on just these big whalers and we just landed on des- some desert island to camp and then we went off again. There's no way I could have done that since. Mm-hmm. So I never went and did any water expeditions since. I mean, st- I can do anything else out with bound now as, as long as it doesn't involve water. And I've mm-hmm. kayaked since with the children, but again, I need to be near land and I don't like going out of my depth so if we were to cross you know a short little space from one side to the other that would terrify me to be out of my depth even going down a little river with the kids on kayaks when where you could actually almost touch the bank either side if it got to be fast going down get me out of here can't do it so maybe it's something to do with speed or being out of control it's definitely to do with being out of control yeah Mm. Mm, which is and completely I'm, I'm understandable. I've been wary of the water. I mean, never been one to love it. Like some people, my, my fourth child is meant to be a mermaid. She lives in the water. Uh-huh. That was never me, but I'd never had a fear of the water, but absolutely now I do, yeah. And that's PTSD. But PTSD is very rarely triggered by me. I mean, I think maybe once since that experience have I been triggered into sort of a panic attack around water because obviously you can be in control, can't you? You, you don't have to choose to be on the water. If I had a, maybe a, something to do with a cooker and the cooker exploding obviously you know you're exposed to cook you have to cook meals every day but luckily it's something where I don't have to put myself in that situation where I'm near water yeah yeah exactly Mm. so So you talked you just mentioned that your fourth child's a mermaid you mentioned that when you were in this tunnel environment your mind was saying but hang on a minute I haven't had my four kids yet so not quite it's not my time but that feeling of I've got to go and do that so you had this experience, you came back, you got married, you had the four kids? I did, absolutely. And I always knew from when I was a child, I always said I'm going to have four children when I'm 33, 35, 37, 39, and that's exactly what I did. Oh, wow, that's quite specific, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Where did that come from? You've just always had a knowing? I've always had these really strange experiences since I was tiny. Yeah, uh-huh. when I was, in fact, since I was five, yeah had amazing experiences since I was five and I could go to weddings and say to my parents from when I was about six seven I could I wasn't aware of adult the adult world at that stage but I could Mm. see a couple standing in front of us and say why are they holding hands because obviously they're husband and wife why are they holding hands and my mother or father would say because they're husband and wife that's you know auntie so-and-so and uncle so-and-so and I'd say but he's not married to her because I could see she was with somebody else or he was with somebody else not sexually in bed with them, but I could see, obviously they're having an affair, but I, I couldn't see the sexual side of it. But I, could, I could see that she was more with somebody else than with him. So I was like, why are they with him? I had all these experiences of, and then somebody would say something to me and I'd say to my mother, that's not the truth, he's telling a lie. And my mother would say, what are you talking about? Because I could see, I could see into this other dimension of, wow. hmm, I, what, that's really confusing. He's saying this, but actually he's doing something else. And I didn't realise that what I was seeing wasn't the physical presence of what we see here because yeah. I was such a young child and nobody explained that to me. So I was always getting into trouble because I'd question things that weren't right. In my childhood language, black was black and white was white. What I was seeing was the truth, but I didn't realise I was seeing things beyond what other people were seeing. And that's why I think I've always painted these experiences um, and had ex- incredible experiences and almost going into that, tunnel and peaceful situation and death experience that was almost confirming what I was sensing and feeling that there is this other dimension that I'm seeing and picking up on all the time and that I visited it and that's just such a gift for me not that I want anyone I wouldn't want to go into that experience again of having you know but to be in that place was 
this is where we're going. Is this where we're going at the end of it? And then what's this life all like? So it makes you question this life. What's the purpose of being here if that's where we're going? And, you know, the, the thought that people think that when you die, that's it finished over. Well, it's not, obviously, because there's this other place that's magic. Mm. And even if you had an NDE, you still don't have the full experience of it. It's something ahead. Exactly. You're entering exactly, in. Exactly, because we come back, right? Beyond that. What is it? If that's just the entrance, and that's, that was certainly for me personally, and I, I imagine every experience of ND is diff- different. For me, that was the entrance way into it. I hadn't quite gone into it, but I was down the line, I was in the white light, but I hadn't entered into it fully. So beyond that, there's something that's wowness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what do you think is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Do you have any insights into that? I feel... Personally, for me, my greatest calling is to enter into pure love. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for me, I was brought up as a Christian, so the whole Christian experience, for me, Jesus is a representation, is a symbol for a person that is pure love. And when you're in that pure love, you're the highest form of any energy that's possible if you measure frequencies and energies, and that is pure white light. So. I feel my soul purpose is like when I'm carrying bitterness and unforgiveness and hatred and rage and rage, all that stuff, I'm lowering my frequency. And so that's just detrimental to me in terms of how I can operate, how I feel and what I can emit and give out. And, you know, we always have these sort of senses of, Oh, I don't like being in that person's negative energy. It's really hard being around that person. Or I love, there's something amazing about that person. I love being around them. And that's the sort of energetic level, which I think we operate. So for me personally, it's striving to come to that place. I'm nowhere near it. (laughs) I'm nowhere near it. But I would just love to, for me, the challenge is, you know, if we all enter that place of love and light and purity, then we're into and we're all interconnected which we know with nature and plants then when I'm in that place where I feel I'm more empowered in that place than less in, than disempowered I feel the birds come my way and just stop I feel that when I feel the trees and nature there's a connection so I just kind of wonder what it would be like if we were all in that place living on the planet with the plants and trees and nature all interconnected I kind of feel there's a there's a plan and a purpose that we're not there yet none of us are aware of it but mm-hmm. The sense of ecstasy and light in the NDE, if I think of my most joyous moment of peace and tranquility and ecstasy when I've been living, then I feel more interconnected with nature and the whole planet, the energetic levels. So I kind of wonder whether that's what we're striving for on Earth, but then, well, obviously none of us achieve that. So how we've got one, you know, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, we've got wonderful examples of people that achieve Dalai Lama, much higher on those levels. But what would the bigger purpose? I don't know. Just don't know. Mm. Do you know, sorry, I just have to interrupt you here. As you're talking, a bird has just come and sat on my window. Never, I've never had that before. So I've got goosebumps right now. As you were talking, it came and it fluttered on the window. It's gone now. It doesn't surprise me. Ah, so honestly, it's just got me all ah, in a good way. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah, that is so amazing. Gosh, and now I'm totally sidetracked as well. Thank you, little bird. I'll just trust that that's part of this message. It's resonating with us. So, yeah. gosh, yes, exactly. So the bigger purpose, it's, it's a question I love to ask because I love our individual perspectives on it and thinking about our individual purpose, our individual mission while we're here, but also collectively as a race, as a whole, as a world on a global scale as well. And I'm not sure that we have the answers. I'm not sure why we keep coming back again and again and again to Mm. attempt another lifetime, have another go. And I love what you said about how you felt like you were just at the very doorway of your experience. When you got there, it was right at the very edge of going into it fully because that's exactly how I feel as well. I feel like I got a glimpse, but I wasn't allowed to go in. And yeah, it gets quite exciting to think what's beyond this world. And even the way that you've been communicating with your family members, with the birds with different things since it's it just makes me think there's such a bigger picture that we we aren't aware of 
totally. And do you know, I was, because I've been involved in various different sort of Christian ministries, for a while I was involved in a healing ministry. And it's really interesting because I'm really aware that when I'm operating at a higher level of non-judgment, um, non-fear, no bitterness, you know, all that stuff that's negative in me holding that negative energy, then I've been involved in healing ministries. And there's one experience where um, we're in a big room and somebody asked me to sort of heal somebody else. Or, and she came up to me and I said, what is it? And she said, I'm crippled with arthritis, head to foot, crippled with pain. And she was sort of, you know, almost her whole body wrapped around. And all I sensed was that I saw her mother leave her at birth and abandon her hand this baby over. And I don't know what that meant, but I just... I, and I didn't want to tell her either, but I just sensed that she needed healing of abandonment. So I just said to her, I'm just really sensing loneliness in there. I was being really gentle with her and, and she burst into tears. Now that's a sign that's obviously resonating with her. So I said, mm. um, I'm just sensing that you just need to hug, you just need to be held, that there's loneliness and even a sense of rejection. So I was testing the water with her and she just burst. She's just crying and crying. She said, my mother left me at birth. My mother left me at birth. And I just said, your pain is going to be um, is going to leave you today because I'm actually going to hold you and hug you, and the love that you've always wanted is going to come through me to you, and I'm just going to hold you in it and heal you of the pain. And her body was then in more pain. It was like something in her was trying to move and get out, and she was literally writhing like this. And I just I just said, just leave, just leave. It's your time to leave and go. And then this peace entered her body. And she never had arthritis ever again. And I really believe, and that's happened a few, well, quite a few times to me, but I can't, I'm a channel for some kind of energy, but I can't do that when I'm in anger, you know, rage, bitterness, unforgiveness, jealousy, all the stuff that's negative on me. So that, that higher presence of energy where you're sitting in that purity of just that light. And what I do is go into that place of white light again, because I think in that white light, none of the fear of what we live in can exist in there. It doesn't exist in there. So whether you call it heaven, whether you call it where you go, afterlife, whatever you want to call that place, I don't think there's anything of the, the negative, the, the, um, the pain, the fear, all that stuff that we have in experience in life that I still do now, PTSD, trauma, jealousy, all that stuff that we have or our triggers, none of it's in that place. So that's why it's just incredible white light. And and say white light, there were also rainbows in it. There were all sorts of colours in that white light. So it wasn't just white light. It was just, again, you can't explain it. But I think where we live here, um, when we can go to that place of operating without that crap and shit, sorry, excuse my language, but I carry all this stuff as well. But when we get rid of it, then there is no pain. There is no sickness. And nothing of that stuff can stand in the presence of that at all. It can't exist. So when, if we die and we're sick, sickness is left in an instant because it cannot exist in that place. It cannot exist. Mm. Um, and those experiences of healings I've had, and even I did it on my nose a few months ago, I had this growth growing. I had it, I had it for a couple of years. And eventually my sister who works in palliative care said, you need to get it seen to her. I think it's cancerous. So I saw the doctor. But before I see the doctor, I just thought, I'm going to go into that presence of white light. I'm going to put my finger on it. And you're going to, I just said, you're going to die, go. And the next few days, it was quite a big sort of mole and it was coming down here. And it was really quite ugly, but I couldn't afford to have it taken off. So I didn't do anything about it. But I just put my finger on it and I felt my finger burning. And the next few days, bits peeled off. Anyway, went to see the doctor and he said, oh, he was a cancer specialist. He said, it's definitely a carcinoma, something, whatever it was. But we need to take that off you and it'd be $390 to start with. And I thought, oh, God, I can't afford that. But I said to him, well, look, bits are coming off. And he went, no, that's not in line with what it should be. That, that doesn't happen. So I said, no, look, look, it's sort of a bit crusty. He went, no, that is not what happens. So, like, okay. Mm. Anyway, two days later, it had completely gone. There's nothing there. There's not even a scar. There's not a mark. And I keep getting messages mm. saying, come back. You must have it removed. And I think, I can't even pay. I don't want to pay $60 just to see him to have a check. I know it's gone. I know it's completely yeah. gone. But when I did that, I was in the presence of that white light and I command, I just command it. I said, you've got no authority to be there. Go. Yeah, wow. And again, it was that white light. Do you think that that is something that we can all tap into, that healing's available for everyone? Because I get, I get people asking me, there seems to be some kind of thought process out there that you have to have had a super spiritual experience or a near-death experience or a out of body or some type of trigger point to access the gift of healing or no. access the gifts that we're talking about. 
So how do, do you know how we do that? Is it simply a matter of just asking, can I have some white light healing, commanding whatever it is to go? How do every, we tap into that? Every single one of us can do it, every single one of us. But I remember in this sort of healing meeting, um, somebody that was leading it said, put your hand on Sue and just kind of heal her or pray for her. And I, I felt the hand on me and it was, I felt... Um, I felt they were having an affair. I felt there was negativity. I felt there was, and I just said, get your hands off me. And because that energy was coming to me, it was really dark. And it, it actually, it actually crumpled my spirits. I'm, I really, I mean, I know this really strongly that we cannot heal when we ourselves are in that negative place of all the things I've talked about, anything that's negative, uh, the terror, the fear, the judgment, PTSD, whatever it is, when we're sitting in that place, because it's darkness, but all of us, that I think that's our sole purpose in life is to love and to come into a place where we deal with our issues, we heal ourselves, we go back into childhood trauma and what the teacher said to us at school and how our best friend bet betrayed us or our husband walked away, whatever it is. We've got to get rid of that stuff. That's our job. That's our journey. If we can't do that, we can't heal ourselves. We can't heal others. But I do believe e absolutely everybody can heal, totally. But we, as we go into our higher being or we kind of go on our spiritual journey of enlightenment, whatever language we want to attach to it, mm. and we go into that white light, then I think we heal. And, you know, in, in the Bible it says, um, you know, what is it that our Father who art in heaven, had been like, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What it means is that heaven is on earth here. We don't die and go to heaven. Heaven is here. We can access heaven here most Christians think they, they die and go to heaven. No, heaven's here. We've got to access it. We access it through going on that journey. And the metaphors are in the Bible about, you know, dying to ego, which is dying on the cross. Die to ego, die to self, die to need, greed, and come to that place of purity. We, we can live in heaven on earth. And I do. A lot of my time, I live on heaven. I just literally walk around and go, wow, wow, wow. It's amazing. Mm. I'd love to go further down into that. I do believe everyone can. And our sole role is not to judge others where they're at because we can so easily f see fault in others, can't we? Our partners, our children, our friends. Oh, if only they did <laughs> Yeah. Only they didn't do this. I would be fine. You know, my life would be perfect if he didn't do this. But our soul world is to do that ourselves. And when I get this slight glimpse of it, I'm in just the wellness. And it is that that is that NDE experience here of white light and peace and tranquility and joy. So I have had moments since that I don't. Well, I don't know. I can't say. Can I? I wonder if I'd have had if I didn't have that experience there. But when somebody said to me, you can have that experience here, so you don't need to wait till you die to have that, I was, oh, okay. And I, I do believe you can because I've had it several times. I have it more and more now than ever. Mm. And it actually, one more thing I'll say is that, you know, the metaphors, again, in the Bible of the, the Israelites leaving Egypt, they were in bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt and they were promised the promised land. The metaphors are, if you look up the, the words in the Bible, the Hebraic language, the words for Pharaoh and the bondage and slavery they were held under was actually they were held in bondage to anger, to rage, to bitterness, to jealousy, to all, to fear, to hatred. Once they were released from that, they went into the desert for 40 years to wander around. And that's where they were healing from the anger, the hatred, because they'd been released from slavery and bondage to it. And then the, the, the promise was to go into the promised land. And I think the promised land metaphorically is the white lights the purity it's the ecstasy feelings heaven on earth you go and you live in heaven on earth there but in that 40 years of wandering around the desert it says lots of the israelites went back to pharaoh in egypt because it was safer there and sometimes we are safer when we are a victim sometimes we're safer when we live in anger and rage and sometimes i was safer in my life when i was in a um destructive relationship it was secure it's what I knew and my identity was a brokenness my identity was being in bondage and slavery to this um, damaging relationship I was in so mm -hmm. I think sometimes we love our identity of sue the sufferer or sue the victim or <clears throat> and so we want to live in bondage to those things we don't want to let go mm -hmm. and the, <clears throat> the metaphor of the, the desert in the middle is really to come to a place where I say okay I'm, I'm free if I'm free of that stuff. Now I've got to do my work. Now I've got to heal myself of that before I can go into ecstasy, promised land, heaven on earth, pure joy, being able to become a healer or healing myself, coming to a place of peace. And we've all got choice. That's the biggest thing. We've got choice. Mm -hmm. Do I come out of Egypt, my bondage to slavery, my bondage to my past, 
my unforgiveness, all that stuff that I hold on to, we all hold on to. I've got choice to become free of it, or I can live in it and and die in that place of, you know, being bitter because this bit in my life didn't work out. He hurt me. She did this. If only that hadn't happened as a child, I'd be fine. So we live in bondage to it. But the metaphors are so powerful in the sense that, okay, well, I kind of, I have phases in there, very few nowadays for me personally, but a lot of the time I'm in the desert wandering around thinking, oh, I've still got a lot of anger in me and that person's really triggered hatred. <laughs> that person's triggered bitterness. And I thought I'd forgiven that person, but actually I haven't. I have to do that again. And then having, I have quite a lot of moments now in life where I'm in that promised land of wellness, but still I come back and I can go in and out of all three different phases. Mm-hmm. It's choice. How much do we want of it? Oh, that is that sums it up so well. So it's about choice. And because I'm very aware as well that things are constantly changing. So we have choice over and over and over again. It's not a one-time thing. And if we screw up and, you know, I am I hear what you're saying there. None of us are perfect. I very much go into my states of not being so pleasant. But if we can let go and just understand we have a choice to reset, a choice to start again, get back up, dust ourselves off. and tapping into that white light I'm really loving that that's really resonating with me the white light with the choice and our ability to navigate constant change just means that anything is possible so so thank you wow I'm blown away the bird on the window was just a whole nother level for me in this interview so thank you so much I really appreciate you sharing your story I know that you've had some other very big stories in your life you've talked about quite a few things already including your trip your near-death experience your work the induced coma when you're in Sydney there are many things and I know that after your experience you went on to have some very very large stuff so I just really love your I'm not quite sure the word for it it's like a steadfastness it's just you've got your feet planted and a very realistic view on life and death, I suppose. So so thank you so much for being vulnerable. Thank you for sharing. And I look forward to staying in touch with you. And I look forward to hearing how things go from, from now onwards and just seeing that glorious light within your life. Kirsty, thank you so much for having me on board today. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Don't forget you can join the free online community over at www.letstalkneardeath.com and I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon.